to Christian's Colloquy. I'm Christian, and I'm so glad that you could join me again for this episode. On today's show, and for the next three shows, I'm going to be doing this channel's first ever series. This will be a time in this episode, in the next three, hopefully three, when I present a person, a book, some of my own reflections, and answer some of your questions, all relating to the specific issue of congregationalism. This is something I announced on my previous episode, and I'm actually doing it. This is a series on congregationalism, congregational polity. And before I get into explaining this series a little bit more and diving into the first installment of this series, I'm going to get out of the way that first initial question, the one that's probably the determining factor in whether you listen or care about congregationalism, and that's to answer what is congregationalism. For some of you, you might have heard this term, maybe you're very familiar with it, but for others, I know it's a weird term. It's not something we use in everyday language, even in our church language, but it's something, if you're a Baptist anywhere, an evangelical, something that you're probably intimately familiar with, something you've been living with for as long as you've been attending your Baptist, evangelical, free church, whatever it might be. So what is congregationalism? What is congregational polity? So there are many different ways I could approach this, but I think the easiest way to get across what congregationalism is, is by presenting it in contrast to other forms of polity. Polity just being a shorthand, a more archaic term for government, church government. So what is congregationalism as a church government? Well, let's take a step back and talk about other forms of church government. If you have seen or heard of or know anything about the Anglican Church, you know that they have bishops. And the bishops are people, single individuals, who are in charge of a diocese, who are in charge of typically a geographical area that all the churches in the province or in the region or in the state answer to this one overarching figure, this bishop, the person who sits upon the episcopal seat of a region, to use those kinds of terms. And that's episcopal polity. It means that the highest human authority, of course, everyone says and believes they answer to Christ as they should as Christians, but in episcopal polity, everyone, humanly speaking, answers to a bishop. The buck stops at the bishop. If there's a problem, if there's a controversy, if there's need for some sort of discipline or response to an issue, the bishop is the final authority who makes a decision. And of course, there are many mechanisms within that, many uh, points of accountability and of discussion and all that kind of thing. But simply put, episcopal polity means rule by bishops, that the bishops are the head of the church government in these kind of settings. Then, on the other hand, you have something like Presbyterian polity or Presbyterial polity. There's a little bit of a difference there. But generally speaking, Presbyterian polity refers to the fact that at the highest level of authority in Presbyterian denominations are the Presbyteries. So, of course, they have their own mechanisms. There's the general assemblies. There's the local sessions and this and that. But ultimately, and stereotypically, we could say, most of the actual governing uh, decision-making, discipline handing out, keeping in check churches, that's done by a presbytery. That's done by a council of elders raised up by various churches or related to various churches who, at the end of the day, they keep everything in check. It's the presbytery governing over a local region that makes decisions. And above the local churches, they have this higher court of the presbytery that they relate to, receive help from, answer to, all these different sorts of things. Again, very simple, uh, simply put. Then finally, that brings us to congregationalism, congregational polity. Unlike Episcopal polity, where churches have a bishop above them, and unlike Presbyterian bodies, where local churches have a presbytery above them, congregational polity, congregation being the root there, there is no higher court above the churches. The churches, at the end of the day, when it comes to theological decisions, decisions of discipline, what to do, how to handle this, the congregation is autonomous.
autonomous. It answers to itself. It is the highest body. And of course, within that, there are all sorts of different mechanisms and ways of working that out. And of course, as you probably are aware, within those congregations, there are elders, there are deacons, there are committees, this and that, and so on. Uh, beyond the local churches, there are conventions and associations. But ultimately, very, very simply put, congregational polity refers to the fact when the congregation is the highest human authority a church answers to. And if you go to a Baptist church, that's probably something you're familiar with. You might either be in an independent church or you might be part of an association, but you probably know if you attend members meetings that ultimately it's the local church that makes all of those governing decisions. When a church wants to raise up a new pastor, the congregation is the one that does that, either through elders or congregational vote. If there's a matter of discipline or receiving in members or sending people to seminary, this and that, whatever it looks like, it's the congregation taking care of all that. There's no bishop they answer to. There's no higher presbytery they answer to. All those decisions are run by the congregation. And I should specify here that within congregationalism, where there are no higher courts, there are different streams or different versions or different traditions of congregationalism. Some invest more authority in the congregation itself. So you might know that this is where uh, some people speak of democratic congregationalism, where the congregation has to vote on everything. Or some have closer to elder rule congregationalism, elder led congregationalism, where the elders of the local church, still in the local church, they make most, if not all, of the decisions. And the congregation approves of what they do, or in some cases just submits to what they do. And of course, there are many different definitions getting into those nitty gritty terms, but hopefully that explains congregationalism to you. Very simply put, the congregation is the highest th human authority for a local church. There is no bishop above them. There is no presbytery above them that they have to answer to or relate to. There are wider associations, but those are horizontal relationships with other churches, not vertical relationships with higher courts. Hopefully that helps. Hopefully that explains what congregationalism is a little bit. We will get into more precise terms and definitions later on, probably in the third and fourth installment in these series. But hopefully now you're interested. Congregationalism, if you're a Baptist, is probably something you've been living with, maybe haven't thought too much about. But now we're going to dive into it from, of course, a historical perspective in keeping with the nature of this channel. So that's what we're talking about. What are we talking about today in this episode? So, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different ways you can approach congregationalism, and there are a lot of fantastic resources out there approaching it in very different ways. Congregationalism is a hot-button issue. Congregationalist churches, churches that have congregational polity, are often putting out resources trying to help their members understand their responsibilities, what they have to do. I'll leave a link down below in this episode to a church I know which has a series explaining uh, their form of congregational polity. I think it's great. Highly recommend you check Check it out. But there are also resources that defend congregationalism against other views because, of course, there's a lot of theological disagreement and debate on a wider scale. There are views which just purely present congregationalism from a biblical perspective. Here's why we do congregationalism. There's resources talking about here's how we practice congregationalism and everything in between. There's a lot of different ways to approach it. But I'm going to approach it historically. And to do that, I'm going to present a specific figure who is massive in the history of congregationalism. And it's here at this point, before introducing this figure, I should make something clear. When people speak of congregationalism, they are, could be speaking of two different things. On the one hand, there's the congregationalist tradition or denomination, which is a very specific reformed Puritan denomination, which uh, still exists to this day, though it's sort of, uh, it's smaller than it once was. A lot of it fell into liberalism and Unitarianism even, but there's still some solid congregationalist churches out there. But when I'm speaking of congregationalism, I'm speaking about that broader polity. Congregationalists, the denomination, use congregational polity, but so do Baptists, uh, so do some free churches. I believe some Pentecostals use a form of congregational polity. Some Lutherans use forms of congregational polity. But I'm speaking about the church government, not the specific denomination. 
Okay, with that clear, today I'm going to be talking about someone who happens to be, who was a part of the Congregationalist tradition and movement, and who also was a huge proponent, defender, and champion of congregational polity. And as you probably saw in the title of this episode, I'm going to be discussing the Puritan John Cotton. And some of you might have heard the name or don't know the name, but why would I discuss John Cotton when doing a first episode on Congregationalism? Instead of explaining that myself, let me read, uh, read to you some quotes from Phil Johnson, what he had to say about John Cotton, and then you can understand why I would approach this topic by sharing a biographical sketch of this famous Puritan of the past. Here's what Phil Johnson has to say. Johnson says of Cotton, Among the luminaries of the early Puritan era, none shines brighter than John Cotton. Already we could see that John Cotton, he's just a brilliant guy. That is high praise. You think of the Puritans, this Christian theological movement that was home to many amazing figures. And Phil Johnson, if you don't know the name, he's a pretty prolific Christian figure in contemporary evangelicalism. Uh, and you might have heard of him. He's often associated with John MacArthur and those camps and doing a lot of historical work. But out of all those great and wonderful Puritans, you probably know the names of a few if you're into church history. John Cotton, he says, stands out. He shines brightly. He is one of those dominant figures. That already tells you something, but there's a little bit more about John Cotton, which makes him especially relevant for opening this series. Johnson also says, One conviction that John Cotton is especially remembered for is his defense of congregationalism. So John Cotton, in addition to just being a brilliant Puritan that we should probably know if we're into Puritans and church history, which we are here, but he was also especially known for what he did on behalf of congregationalism. That's something we'll get to, especially next episode. But as a titan of Puritanism, John Cotton was a champion of congregationalism, one of the leading figures defending, promoting, and in a lot of ways, developing congregational polity as we know it today. Here's a final word from Johnson on uh, John Cotton. I would argue that the Great Awakening of Jonathan Edwards' era represented a return to New England's spiritual roots, a harvest that sprang from seeds planted by John Cotton. That is probably the highest form of praise that we could hear about John Cotton. As a lot of you know who watch this channel a lot, we're big fans of the evangelical revival here, the first great awakening where figures like Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and John Wesley were preaching revival and God was bringing about revival in England and New England through them. And here, uh, Johnson is saying that that John Cotton was one of those figures who planted the seeds for that revival, that he was one of those figures that what really performed the basis for this revival. When the New England evangelicals came on the scene, they were hearkening back to what John Cotton was doing, his ministry, his pastoral work, and a lot of his theology. So that's something, if you're interested in evangelicals like I am, we have to recognize something I've been learning a lot this year is that evangelicalism really developed, really grew, in conversation with the Puritans that came before. If we think about New England evangelicalism with Jonathan Edwards, we have to recognize that that was a movement, a spiritual movement that was a great movement of Christian faith and piety. That was a movement looking back to the Puritans such as John Cotton and his piety, his spirituality, his pastoral work, and his preaching ministry. So it's all fit together. And if we want to appreciate where we are today as evangelicals, as Reformed Christians, as Protestants, whatever we might be watching this, we have to recognize John uh, John Cotton Sorry, is a figure who looms large in this history as we think about our own history. So that's why we're talking about John Cotton. How will we open this series on congregationalism? First, in this episode, I will introduce one of the great figures of congregational history, the one who was really known as one of its brightest lights and one of its greatest defenders and just a wonderful Christian minister who laid the seeds, who planted the seeds that would be the New England revival, the first great awakening. Hopefully that explains it. Now, that's the first episode. We'll get into his biographical sketch in a moment, but let me just lay out the plan for the next three episodes after this one. 
In this episode, I will be presenting the life of John Cotton, who he was, where he came from, especially in reference to his early life. Uh, this is not going to be a detailed biography. I encourage you, if you're interested, get a biography. For this show to prepare, I read this biography, John Cotton, Patriarch of New England. A link to that in the description down below. It is a great biography, and what makes it especially great is that it's a new edition of an older biography. This biography was initially published over 100 years ago by a congregational minister, I believe, in New England, speaking about his spiritual ancestors, and it was brought back to us today through h &E Publishing, edited by Nate uh, Picklewitz, and I highly suggest you check it out. Not only is it valuable because it tells us about John Cotton, this was, again, my main piece of uh, uh, secondary material in researching, but it also is interesting in appreciating what biographies used to look like. You will notice throughout this older biography that the author inserts their own theological opinions, a lot of reflection, a lot of strong words and statements. This isn't an academic biography. It's very much a pastoral biography speaking to real issues. Clearly the guy held his subject in high esteem and wasn't afraid to share that. So John Cotton, Patriarch of New England, that's the source material for today as I really just present some of the critical details of especially the early life Life of John Cotton, who he was, where he came from. So that's this episode. In the next episode, I'm going to zoom in a little bit and look specifically at one of the key works of John Cotton on congregationalism, his keys to the kingdom of heaven. Brilliant work, very influential work. I, uh, I will present it next week a little bit and some of the other works and events floating around in terms of congregationalism, zooming really in on John Cotton's involvement in the world of polity, especially among Puritans and English Protestants. But that will zoom in on this work in particular because this is the work that really put congregationalism on the map. Next time we will be talking about the work about congregationalism from John Cotton that convinced John Owen and other amazing Puritans, brilliant Puritans, Puritans you might be familiar with, this is the work that convinced them of congregationalism, which brought them on board with this polity. And that's what we will talk about next time. This is the early life in this show. Next show, we'll zoom in on his contributions to congregationalism. Understanding then historic congregationalism next time, the time after that, I will share some of my thoughts as a member and elder of a Baptist church about congregationalism today. These first two shows are looking at the history. The third one, I will be discussing how I relate to congregational polity today. Why am I a congregationalist? What do I believe that congregationalism should look like in my churches? What do I believe it should look like in theory and how it actually plays out and those type of issues. Finally, in the last episode of the series, as I mentioned last time, I will be doing a Q&A. I already have some questions that people have about congregationalism. Congregationalism is a hot-button theological issue. There's a lot of debate about polity, especially in the online world, a lot of articles, blogs, podcasts. I will do my best to answer questions that you, my audience, might have. I already have three or four questions, but if you have more, feel free. Shoot me an email. Hit me up on social media if you have me, or leave a comment on my YouTube page or wherever else you can find me. Happy to answer some questions if I have the time. And if it requires its own show or a blog post, I'm happy to do that as well. So that will be the last show. Anyway, that's enough of an int introduction. We went on very long. I will try to be brief now in presenting the life and some of those especially early details of John Cotton, the famous New England minister. Here we go. John Cotton was born in Derby, England in 1585. He was raised by wealthy parents, and Cotton began, supported by his parents, his studies at Trinity College at Cambridge at age 13. So, he must have been very bright. It's clear that he was well supported. His family was wealthy enough to be able to send him to school. His father was a lawyer, and he goes off to Trinity College at age 13. Eventually, while studying at Cambridge, he was there for many years, over a decade, he eventually became a fellow of Emmanuel College. And as a fellow at Emmanuel College, he was known for his expertise in the Hebrew language and the Old Testament. He did many of his writings on Isaiah. That was his favorite book to study. 
Just very briefly, I should mention that Emmanuel College, where John Cotton found himself, that was really a center of Puritanism in the Church of England. We've talked about Puritanism many times on this channel before, what it means, where it was going, who some of those figures were, but it should be clear to us that Emmanuel College, if you went there, you were going to be surrounded by Puritanism in the late 16th, early 17th century. That's where the heart of English Puritanism was, especially in terms of academics. And that's where John Cotton found himself. While at uh, uh, Emmanuel College, the center of Puritanism, Cotton found himself under the influence, sitting under the pre uh, preaching of William Perkins, and then later on, Richard Sibbs, two leading figures in the Church of England, and heralded today, maybe a bit anachronistically, I'll leave that for you to study if you're interested, but William Perkins and Richard Sibbs are often regarded as leading early and moderate Puritans. William Perkins is sometimes called the father of Puritanism, very influential in Puritan preaching and Puritan ministry. Richard Sibbs, a powerful Puritan pastor, he's known for his devotional work, uh, the Bruce Reed, just two Titan Puritans, and John Cotton was sitting under their preaching. Initially, he found it convicting, especially under Perkins. He didn't like the preaching because it was hitting so close to home. But eventually, it should be clear to us that after listening to their preaching, especially Richard Sibbs, and the biography puts it as after years of anxious inquiry and mental, mental conflict, Cotton was genuinely converted at age 27 while studying at Cambridge at Emmanuel College, surrounded by these Puritans. So God worked through the Puritan movement at Emmanuel College and eventually brought true conversion to John Cotton. And it's an amazing story. Again, highly recommend. These are just the details. Get a biography if you're interested. I'll leave links to this biography that I worked with and other biographies in the description down below. Some lectures and interview with the author of this biography. Check it out. John Cotton, very interesting. And that is his early life converted at Emmanuel College at Cambridge. What a tale, check it out. But moving on from there. At age 28, shortly after his conversion, Cotton would begin to minister in Old Boston. I call it Old Boston because this is a city of Boston located in England, a historic city. And it's while he was ministering in Old Boston, still a part of the Church of England, he was a minister in the Church of England, within that Puritan party of the Church of England, this is where things began to change for John Cotton. First of all, he faced a Theory, a serious theological controversy over Arminianism, and based on this biographical account I read, he handled it quite well. He faced down the arguments and really became known as a leading preacher and defender of the doctrines of grace, what we call Calvinism today. It's also while at Old Boston that Cotton would marry for the first time. He had another marriage, and of course, there are many details of his life I won't mention here, but please check out the biography. Just know for now that this is where he not only got his theological beginnings, but this is where he also got his family begin beginnings really entering into his life as it would become. And then finally, while ministering at Old Boston, the young preacher Cotton also after three years there, embraced nonconformity. That's when he transitioned from the Puritan party within the Church of England into the more separatist movements, the nonconforming movement, though those who decided they could no longer worship in accordance with the regulations, the prayer books, and rules of the Church of England and carved out their own path. Still related to the Puritan spiritual movement, but now practicing outside of the Church of England's structure. And that's where John Cotton found himself for quite some time there in Old Boston. I encourage you again, I'm going to keep saying it, check out a biography if you're interested, listen to some lectures. While at Old Boston, there was so much more going on for John Cotton. He was practicing his nonconformity. He was relating to bishops who were uh, ruling over the region where he was. He was engaging in more theological controversy. There were trials, there was persecution, and it's just a wonderful tale. So much going on, and it's easy to miss. John Cotton's often known for his time in New England, but while still in England in his early life, he was incredibly active, a lot of correspondence. He was already a big figure that people would seek out dialogue from. But moving on with John Cotton. 
1633, John Cotton had to flee the persecution of Archbishop Laud. Laud is someone we discussed on the channel before. He became the Archbishop of the Church of England, uh, the Diocese of Canterbury, a leading figure in the Church of England, and he was very much anti-Puritan anti-Puritan within the Church of England, but also non-conformist, and he wanted to get rid of them. Uh, he, there are accounts of his brutal persecution, slicing off noses and ears, that sort of thing. And as we discussed on the channel before, Puritans in the Church of England and without had a choice. Either they would stay and form underground churches, flee to Holland, which was an option for John Cotton, but he eventually changed his mind, or, and this is what John Cotton did, he would journey to New England, to the colonies there. And that's exactly what he did. At age 48, John Cotton would flee to New England and he would eventually become a teacher at the Congregational Church in New Boston, in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts, in New England. And that, of course, is an interesting coincidence where he was at Old Boston and he really got his start there. And then at New Boston, he got his new start as a Congregational Minister. It's important here to note that, Con uh, that John Cotton didn't become the pastor of the church, but rather the teacher of the church. And here is where we begin to get an idea of how old historic congregationalism was a bit different from how we understand and often practice congregationalism today. That's something I'll get into next episode and the episode after, but to just give you an idea of what was going on here, I'm going to quickly quote one of uh, the old, older and most historic, I guess, documents of Congregationalism, and that is the Cambridge Platform, really a document that outlined Congregational polity as it was being practiced by New England Puritans, New England Congregationalists. Here's what it has to say about the role of teacher which John Cotton came to inhabit in the 1630s. The office of pastor and teacher appears to be distinct. The pastor's special work is to attend to exhortation, and therein to administer a word of wisdom. The teacher is to attend to doctrine, and therein to administer a word of knowledge, and either of them to administer the seals of that covenant. That is a very interesting picture, but essentially what it's saying is that pastors and teachers are distinct offices. They're separate. While the pastor takes care of more of that moral preaching, that exhortation to live rightly and to provide wisdom in response, the teacher as an officer of the church is more uh, working in response to doctrine. They would be actually teaching people what they should believe, why they should believe it, and applying and providing words of knowledge. So in a lot of ways, pastors were about the congregation walking the walk, and teachers were about congregations having ability to talk the talk, to believe what they needed to believe. Very interesting distinction there. And it sort of reflects what you see in congregational churches today, where some pastors, you'll see it at larger churches, there's a lead pastor who preaches, there's a pastor of discipleship, there's a pastor of congregational life. We have different roles, but they're all often called pastors. That gets into one of these distinctions within the congregational polities, tradition, and historical development. So John Cotton became a teacher. He was very much involved in teaching doctrine, in articulating doctrine, in defending doctrine, and that's critical to when we get to later discussions about John Cotton and where he was. So that's John Cotton as he developed, but there's more we can say about John Cotton and his work there. While in Boston, and this is New Boston, John Cotton's time was incredibly eventful. He had a lot going on. There were discussions about church and state, how ministers should relate to magistrates. There were many conversations about the Mosaic Law, how Christians should understand that. There was a formation of an association, so congregationalist ministers coming together as an association. We discussed that a little, and we'll get back to that in a future episode. There was a, con a controversy with Roger Williams, Roger Williams going on to become the founder of the First Baptist Church in America. I believe that was in 1638. So you can see how Congregationalists, the Puritan denomination, were having early, <laughs> they were butting heads and relating to initially well at first and then not so well with uh, people who would become Baptists. And then finally, there was a controversy with Anne Hutchinson on antinomianism. That is a big case, a big deal. I'll link to something about that in the description down below. Anyway, that is all 
a summary of essentially who John Cotton was. He was an incredibly influential minister. He was dealing with a lot of theological topics, but at the end of the day, he was a teacher in a church who wanted to teach people doctrine, who wanted to teach people what they were to believe about God so that they can then go on to walk the walk with God. So they can believe in God and then walk with God. And it's part of that church life and flowing out from the church life. That's where John Cotton would engage in all sorts of theological controversy do all sorts of writing, all in the context of what Christians should believe. And now, in closing, I just want to highlight a couple of things here. The reason why I introduced uh, John Cotton at first is to remind us all that church history is really a history of people. There are ideas, there are writings, there are books, there are debates, there are events, but at the end of the day, we're actually dealing with real people people who lived their lives and were doing their work and walking with God. And that's something it's easy to forget, uh, forget, especially discussing figures like the Puritans or Reformers, but it's something that comes out a lot more strongly with the Evangelicals. Something I noticed with Evangelicals, for better and for worse, is that our understanding of their movement and their theology is profoundly wrapped up in our appreciation of their biographical stories and their life events. And I want to bring that a little bit to the Puritans like John Cotton. So, Before we dive into his theology, we'll be doing next time, I thought I would share a bit about his life. And that's where I want to go. There's so much more I could say about John Cotton. Again, pick up a biography, an incredible life, so many events. But I really just wanted to give you a little discussion of his early life and some of those critical events throughout his life. Not so that you would come away with a perfect understanding of who he is and what he was about, but more so that you can understand his general place in church history, why people would listen to him, why he was saying what he was saying, and where he came from. So, to give you a brief overview of what we just talked, what's important to remember about John Cotton as we move into the next episode. First of all, he had that strong upbringing at Emmanuel College where he was interacting with Puritanism. Puritanism was something baked into him early on, and that would come with Uh, a deep and profound awareness for the role, authority, and supremacy of Scripture in his life, and the fundamental importance of walking with God. That was something he picked up on from his Puritan mentors and surroundings. A A second thing to remember is that John Cotton had a very bad experience with the Church of England. He had to flee persecution led by the Archbishop of the Church of England, and that was something that, of course, would influence him and shape him. The third thing to note is that John Cotton was very involved in the early American landscape. He was a big figure in American history as the Massachusetts uh, Puritan colony was figuring out those issues of church and state, church government, but also government in general. So keep that all in your heads, his Puritan upbringing, his bad experience with the Church of England, his role within the history of the American colonies, as we then next week go on to discuss his writing, his teaching and his understanding of church governance, of congregational polity. Anyway, that's for next time. I hope that you enjoyed this first episode of this new series on congregationalism, and I hope that you will enjoy me for the next episodes as we unpack this further, as we talk more about John Cotton, and then we get a bit more into the contemporary discussion where hopefully you will be involved by sending me your questions. Anyway, that's truly it for now. I will see you next time here on Christian's Colloquy. Take care.